uh, Dr. Jeff Allison, who's going to be talking about the self under siege, coping with shame, guilt, and humiliation. All right. Thanks, Christy. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, for coming. It'd be really lonely talking to an empty room right now. I'm going to start with four examples of emotional situations, and I want you to play along. I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of the characters, imagine what they're feeling, and uh, sort of kind of empathize, and then specifically try to come up with an emotion label. What word would you choose to describe that situation? Just to get us started here. And for this first situation, uh, picture a seventh grade boy, uh, kind of weak for his age, 90 pound weakling, his <coughs> self portrait. Um, <laughs> and, and he hates gym class, right? Like all 98 pound weaklings, he hates gym class. But unfortunately, that's where we find him, standing around with the rest of the kids, waiting for the teacher to come in and, and start class. And while they're waiting, the biggest kid in the class sneaks up behind him, grabs his gym shorts, and you know the rest, right down to the ankles, right? And everybody cracks up laughing at him. All right, so this poor little boy, bullied, mocked, others laughing at him, how's he gonna feel in that situation? Very embarrassed, okay. Would anybody say so embarrassed it might be humiliating? Okay, okay, all right, that's what I picked um, and got research to back that, but um, I'm gonna let Noah describe this situation. So, Paul and I are at the game last weekend, and uh, I'm going to the bathroom and I see this pretty hot girl, not in the bathroom, but, you know. <laughs> so uh, I see this hot girl and she's kind of looking at me, so, you know, swagger up, you know, do, do the look, you know. And, um, and uh, she's like, hey, can I ask you two questions? And yeah. And she's got, behind her back, she's got a mic. She pulls up a mic, and she's got a camera guy right there, and uh, all these people start gathering around, and some TV interview. I'm like, oh, okay, this is what doesn't like me. But, um, <laughs> oh, man. So anyway, so now I'm sitting there, like, uh, trying to talk, but I can't even, like, you know, breathe right, you know, like in speech class when you're like, and then the, the nuclear power is a <laughs> You know, like, the big awkward. Uh, silly breaths, and uh, yeah, and I'm sure everyone thought I was really, really cool, and uh, so I had to go bury myself after that. It was just, it was horrible. <laughs> no, it does a great job of uh, describing that situation. That's actually one of the stimuli I used in my dissertation, along with many others. Notice at the very end of that, he said he had to go bury himself after that it happened. We're going to come back to that in about a half an hour. Um, so he looks foolish in public. How's he going to feel in this situation? Embarrassed? Embarrassed? Maybe not quite as humiliated, it's not as intense. Okay, um, <clears throat> that's what I picked. For this third situation, picture a college-age girl goes home from school at the, ho at the break to visit her parents. Her parents are antique collectors. They've got this nice uh, glass antique cabinet that they keep these valuables in. Her father walks her over to it and unlocks it, pulls this one out, hands it to her and starts telling her the story about you know where they found this and the history behind it and how much it means to them. And she's listening intently so intently that it slips from her hands and smashes on the floor. And she looks up, and he's not angry. He just has this shocked look of loss on his face. What do you think she might feel? Guilty. Okay. Um, I picked guilt. Uh, let me do one more here. Another seventh grader, this time seventh grade girl. She's been a straight A student all the way through elementary school. But as we all know, that transition to junior high can sometimes be challenging. She's bringing home her first report card for junior high, and it's C's and D's. How is she going to fa um, feel facing mom and dad? Disappointed in herself. Disappointed in herself? Shame. Okay, maybe shame. All right. And <clears throat> so the situation kind of looks like this. You know, s some of us picked different words. Some of you picked maybe multiple words. And that's part of the point that I want to make here is that these are fuzzy concepts. They don't have hard and fast boundaries where this is shame and this is totally different than guilt, right? They blend together, um, they overlap. They're correlated in that they overlap, but they're also correlated in another way. Um, as psychologists, we're very interested in individual differences. So we're interested in the normative, what is true for almost everybody, but we're also interested in individual differences, like who's more extroverted, um, who's more depressed, maybe what variables predict depression. Well, these are correlated um, in that people who are more prone to one are also more prone to the other. There's been a lot of research on shame proneness and guilt proneness, and the two are correlated. And what I mean by proneness is, 
Some people are more, shame is more easily triggered in some people. They experience it more often, they experience it more intensely. And for those people, um, it's kind of a normal curve. If you experience too little, that's a bad thing. If you experience too much, if you're too shame prone, that's a bad thing. And it can lead to things like depression and low self-esteem. Uh, more on that in about a half an hour. They're also self-conscious emotions. That's another name for this group of emotions in that they make us think about ourselves. They make us self-aware, like what did I just do? And suddenly you're thinking about yourself and how you're presenting yourself to others. And finally, <laughs> they kind of run from mild to very intense. You know, um, Noah's plight was fairly mild. It might be the kind of thing that you'd tell your friends about later and laugh about. And we often do laugh about these situations once they're over. They can also be so mild that they can be non-conscious. And for some people that seems odd, the idea of a non-conscious emotion. But there's lots of research to support that we do have non-conscious emotions and they affect our behavior, um, affect our behavior, affect our decisions. So I want to throw that out there. Um, <clears throat> This is kind of where I'm headed today. We talked about the examples already. I'm gonna talk about a model of shame. Uh, those examples were part of it. I'm gonna talk about these other things. The prevalence, shame, and these related emotions are all around us all the time. They serve very important adaptive functions. We wouldn't wanna live without them. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we typically respond or cope with or defend against these experiences. And then I'm gonna talk about humiliation as a special case, especially as it relates to violence, school shootings, and then just wrap up with some implications. So for this model of shame, uh, I just want to give you a, a little broader perspective on how psychologists and emotion researchers think about emotions, at least a lot of people think about them this way. We, there's a, um, a theory of a basic emotions theory that we have a very small set of basic emotions that are experienced um, universally. We see these in all cultures, they have similar facial expressions, they're triggered by similar things. Um, and they serve similar functions. So it's almost like taste buds. You only have so many taste buds or the receptors in your eyes. You only receive so many different um, color signals, but then they blend together so we can get mixes and stuff. But if you look at these words, rage, anger, mad, irritated, we treat it as one family, one basic emotion family, like one set of taste buds in a sense. These are all the anger family, and it's kind of arbitrary what word you pick, but that's what researchers have chosen. So this is an emotion family, and like I said, they share lots of things in common, like their function and what elicits or triggers them. So we can look at um, shame the same way. I gave you examples of these four, and we have a few more words in English, and we can call these the shame family. So I'm gonna s make the argument that they share a lot of things in common. So we can throw one conceptual net around these and, and call that the shame family. All right, <clears throat> I said they serve adaptive functions and that they're all around us. And I think that makes them worthy of um, a talk. Uh, but when it comes to prevalence or ubiquity, ubiquitous means it's something that's all around us, I'm just gonna go through a list. These show up every day in our lives. Anytime you make a mistake, you're likely to feel a little bit embarrassed about it or worse. Um, doesn't matter if you're a teacher, a parent, a coach, you know, in lots of different contexts, we make mistakes or as a student, um, and we may feel embarrassed about those. When it comes to health-seeking behavior or safety behaviors, health behaviors, we're often affected by shame. So I want everybody to raise your hand if you've ever hesitated to raise your hand and ask a question. Have you ever hesitated to ask a question because you were afraid of embarrassing yourself or asking a stupid question or even just simply drawing attention to yourself? Right? We all do that. That's a simple help-seeking behavior. Hey, teacher, could you explain this? Oh, I'm not going to ask it. You're losing out because you didn't do that. On the very serious side of that, people will fail to go to see a doctor if they're too ashamed of their condition. This is acknowledged in this correction um, poster from the Department of Corrections. Shame can be fatal if you don't go to the doctor when you need to go. So hopefully doctors realize that they need rapport with their cli or clients or patients, um, that they, sometimes people will be resistant to talking about what's going on. I mentioned safety behaviors. You know, if you're an adolescent and you're just too cool to wear your seatbelt or too cool to wear a helmet when you're riding your motorcycle, and I don't mean to pick on adolescents, you know, because I'm too cool for a helmet. Um, and I like self-deprecating humor. So just some examples. Sports and games, it didn't take me long when I uh, Googled humiliation in the Broncos uh, to find this headline. Okay, apparently October 30th, there must have been a bad game. I don't watch football. I've only heard about this Tebow guy, mostly from Saturday Night Live. 
Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, we use that in sports all the time. I've given similar talks, and, you know, every couple of years I, I Google shame and humiliation and embarrassment in different sports, and, man, there are a bunch of them that come up. Peer relationships. This really makes sense, as you'll see when I get back to the model. <clears throat> this little girl doesn't know how to spell embarrassed, but she knows the dynamic. She knows what's going on. <laughs> you know, this boy is not ready to be kissed by a girl. So, um, physical appearance, we may feel embarrassment or shame or even humiliation when it's that really bad hair day, right? Um, and I, I hate to flip-flop back and forth, but on the, on the other side of it, it can also be very, very serious and life-threatening. Anorexia and uh, shame are intimately intertwined in a number of different ways. Uh, business and politics, boy, you Google these and it's not hard at all. <clears throat> so Eurozone's fate hangs on French, whether French humiliation turns to anger. And this is because their credit was downrated. Um, but notice the anger. There's a humiliation anger link that I'm going to talk about later on. So I see these headlines and I'm just like, yeah, this all fits my theory or the theories of others. Um, as of January 31st, Mitt Romney knew no shame. And like I said, shame's important. Being called a person without shame is an insult. In some cultures, that's a big insult, right? But, you know, luckily for Mitt, by February 4th, it was Newt Gingrich who was the man with no shame, or both, you know. Um, I won't even comment. And I realized I'm so old school, I had newspaper headlines, and actually all these come off the internet, so um, I had to put newspaper in quotes. Finally, entertainment. We like our shame, we like our humiliation. When I say our, when it's somebody else's, all right? American Idol is all about judging other people, mocking them, right? This guy's made a career out of it. I don't know if I've ever seen American Idol, but I've been told about it. Um, I've seen segments. Uh, you know, Jersey Shore, these reality TV shows, you know, just think how proud her mother must be. Um, you know, the, uh, so many of the interactions are things that are embarrassing, humiliating, that humiliate each other, and uh, most people should be ashamed to be on these shows. <laughs> and we, we have another category here that's very important because it's, um, it's so covert, we don't even realize it. Shame and embarrassment affect our behavior every single day. Think about what you do before you walk out the door. You're not experiencing those. You're taking preemptive steps so you don't experience those. So you get up in the morning, most of us shower, most of us put on deodorant, most of us brush our teeth, some of us use Listerine. You know, we pick out what we're gonna wear. Uh, we try to be at work on time. You know, there are a lot of things we do that are be where our behavior has been shaped by past experience, right? And marketing takes advantage of this, you know? I Googled, um, and I've done this <coughs> every year for a couple, well, quite a few years, odor-causing germs on Google. How many hits do you think? Oh. 518,000, and that's up 150,000 from less than a year ago. I do a workshop, the same thing, except over 14 hours or something, 12 hours. Um, so I, I had Googled this uh, last July, <coughs> and it was 150,000 less than this. And it's interesting, the variety of products. We don't want our dogs to smell, we don't want our armpits to smell, we don't want our breath to smell, we don't want our feet to smell, we don't want our carpets to smell, we don't want our houses to smell, we don't want our cars to smell. Our garbage, oh, we don't want our garbage to smell, right? They've got special bags for that. So, you know, we're ashamed of, of smelling and being human. So, <coughs> I want to, I, I hope, did I convince you that it's prevalent? ubiquitous, it's all around us. Um, and there's a lot more to that argument. So let's look at the adaptive functions. I said that these families share a number of things. So what is sh shared by these four emotions? Well, they're all elicited by what I and some other people in the literature have called devaluation. And um, Charles Cooley, around the turn of the century, the previous, like 1902, uh, sociologists really hit this, uh, hit the nail on the head, as I should have said. Um, he called it the looking glass self. For those of you who aren't old, looking glass is a mirror, as you can see. So we see ourselves mirrored through the eyes of others. And it's that mirror that comes back at us that leads us to feel good about ourselves, something along the pride axis, or bad about ourselves, something along the shame embarrassment axis. So Cooley totally pegged this. He said, we have an imagined image in the eyes of the other. I mean, I make impressions of everybody I see, 
and I know I'm making an impression on you. So I imagine that image in your eyes, and I know that I judge other people, you know, not consciously, it's very automatic. This has been shown in study after study that one of the um, things that we do as humans, one of the things our brain does is judges things as good or bad, life in general, any situation, anything I'm eating, but anything I'm experienced. And so I know that there's a judgment out there. And then that is followed by some sort of self-related feeling, uh, shame or pride. And he actually used uh, pride or mortification. Mortification is one I haven't thrown out yet, but it's in the same family. And he was using these words in the same way that I'm using them as being all-encompassing across all these different emotions, even at very, very mild levels. Another sociologist who's followed on his heels, uh, Thomas Sheff, just brilliant writer, um, claims that we're pretty much almost every waking hour in one state or the other. Things are either good and we feel good about ourselves or things aren't so good. And sometimes that's non-conscious. He makes the same non-conscious argument. Um, I, I have to keep moving. There's so much I could say. <laughs> um, so I said it, it serves a very important function for us, and this function is so analogous to pain. It's an incredibly tight analogy because shame is painful. If you look at the pain system, what triggers physical pain? Injuries? Doc? What else? No illness. <laughs> Thanks. Illness. Um, so injury or illness? What triggers shame? What's that? It, like, it depends on where you're going. I mean, injuries could cause shame too, in a way. Well, they, they can cause shame too. But I'm going to make the claim that it's a relational injury. It's an injury to my relationship with someone else. It's a rela an injury to how they see me. And it may be an injury to my social standing, my social rank, how people perceive me in general. Now, I'll come back to that soon. Um, going back to Cooley, I said devaluation. Um, I have this image that I want to project. You know, for some people, I know them very well and I want them to think very highly of me. Other strangers, I don't care so much about. So devaluation is when that image is something less than I want it to be, and it doesn't have to be negative. So let me give you a scenario I think you can relate to. Um, a guy and a girl have been hanging out for like six months. They've become really good friends, right? And the guy finally talks to her and says, you know what, I really, really like you. I kind of like to take this a step further and start dating. And she says, you're such a great guy. You're pretty much my best friend. Right? All this positive feedback. Isn't this going well? Right? And then what follows? What follows? And how does he feel? She just said some really honest, positive things about him. And then he feels like hell afterwards. And you might say, well, that doesn't sound like shame to me. but." Um, you know, we might call it hurt feelings, we might call it disappointment, but the argument's been made that it um, fits the same mold. It's actually in the same family. We just label it poorly in, in the United States and in Western individualistic cultures. We have a very um, <clears throat> unusual perspective on shame compared to a lot of other places. And even historically, if you look back in literature, um, the representation of shame has been more like I've presented it, very broad, encompassing all these different experiences from mild to intense. In Western cultures, we see shame as almost synonymous with guilt. Okay, it's intense, and it's usually about moral, morality, moral failings. Okay, and that's not so um, in other areas necessarily. So remember, when I'm using the word shame, I'm talking about the shame family. I, I don't want to list them all every time. I could say shame and related emotions, and I will occasionally to remind you. But I'm talking about the whole family. So there's this injury to my social being, my social status, or relationship. The feeling, we've got physical pain. Feeling here, we have emotional pain. And the two are incredibly similar. Think about what it feels like to get dumped or to have a death in the family. Okay, that sense of loss, you know, the, the pit in your stomach, broken heart. Why do we say broken heart? Well, scientists can tell you why we say broken heart. Um, an excellent, excellent study from about eight years ago. This was published in Science, top um, scientific journal in the world. Just a brilliant study. They put people in an fMRI scanner, and maybe some of you are familiar with MRIs for injuries where we can scan tissue. In an fMRI, they can scan your brain, and the F part is, means functional. So it's online, real time. They can have you do a task, like look at something that's scary, and see the scary area of your brain light up. The amygdala lights up when you're afraid. Well, <laughs> what they did is they took two groups of um, Participants, one group, they were chronic pain, um, they had abdominal pain, they were chronic pain. 
patients, put them in the fMRI scanner, and then the nice scientists go over and push on their bellies and induce pain in them. In one area of the brain, the ACC lights up um, associated with physical pain. Well, then they put the other group in there, and they had them play this ball toss task. It's a silly task that you play on the computer with three little figures, and you're pressing buttons. If the ball comes to you, I left click, and it goes to the other person. If I right click, it goes to that person. And they let you play for about 30 seconds, and then the other two people throw the ball back and forth, and they don't throw it to you. How do you feel? You feel left out. You feel excluded. Does that hurt? Yeah, it does. And we have an emotional pain mechanism that's attached. It's piggybacked on top of the other. So when you stimulate emotional pain, it stimulates physical pain. And that's why emotional pain hurts. And that's the way evolution works. You know, one adaptation often builds on existing functionality. So this makes total sense. And I've got to watch what I say because we have a real evolutionary psychologist over here. Um, but uh, the point is, the analogy is very tight. It really does hurt. An excellent article, just incredible. Um, I wish I had more time uh, to talk about this. But anyway, getting back to the point, the functionality. Now I don't even have two columns anymore because the functionality is so much the same. What's one of the functions of physical pain? To draw your attention to the fact that you're injured or sick, right? Picture yourself at a party. You end up in the kitchen where all good parties end up, right? You're in this conversation. You're talking to somebody. Great conversation. You're so intent on this conversation that you don't notice that the stove is hot. And you lay your hand down on that, right? You don't need to wait to smell your burning flesh. You feel that pain and you react right away. Okay, so your attention has been directed to the problem and you've been motivated to stop doing what you're doing. All right, now switch the scenario a little bit up to the conversation. You're in this great conversation and now instead of leaning on the hot stove, you say the wrong thing and that person looks at you with a look of contempt or disparagement or disapproval. Where does your attention go? It's interrupted the conversation just like the hot stove. It's made you focus on yourself, self-consciousness, what did I say? It's directed me, it's alerted me that there's a problem. It's an alarm just like pain that's alerted me that there's a relational injury that just happened. I'm motivated to cease leaning on the stove or talking about whatever I was talking about. I'm motivated to repair. If I'm injured in physical pain, I'm going to put a Band-Aid on that or something. Um, and socially, I'm motivated to try to repair. I may apologize. I may backpedal. I may pretend like it was a joke. I didn't really mean that about Gingrich. Um, you know, or whatever it is. <laughs> Uh, if you've said something stupid, you may try extra hard in the minutes that follow to look intelligent for a change. That happens to me in class all the time. Um, don't pull it off very often. And future avoidance, right? You're not going to lean on those hot stoves in the future, and you may generalize and look out for hot objects in general. How likely are you to bring up that subject with that person again? Not very likely. You're going to avoid that in the future, and you may generalize and just not talk about that with anybody. So very, very tight analogy here. Um, so how do we get there? <coughs> how, did we, how did the brain add on this adaptation? Well, we can go to our friend Charles Darwin here. And we're a social species. There's absolutely no doubt. We live in groups. We don't like to be alone. Solitary confinement is horribly punishing. Why is that? Because evolution's made us that way. It's made us very sensitive to being alone. It's made, us, made it very rewarding to be with other people and to have other people think positively of you. Why? Because group membership has a lot of advantages. Food sharing, you know, picture ourselves 30,000 years ago living in a group of 50 people. All right, if you've got a bad day hunting and gathering and somebody else has a good day, maybe they'll share with you, you share with them next time, everybody wins. Same with healthcare, hopefully everybody's not sick at the same time. There's safety in numbers, and you know, we think of survival of the fittest, but bottom line, survival doesn't matter unless you reproduce and continue your genes. Um, so it's really reproduction. When it comes to evolution, reproduction is the bottom line, and it's really hard to do that without mates. So um, <laughs> basically, exclusion equals death. Okay, good. I'm glad you get my dry jokes. Exclusion equals death, and even if it doesn't equal death, it, you know, you've got very limited mating um, opportunities if you're out there alone. So evolution's prepared us um, to be group living. And we see this, we see this uh, inclusion-exclusion as a common theme in, in literature, on TV, and movies. Um, Survivor, what do they do? I, I've never watched a full 
episode even, much less a season, but at the end of every one, right, don't they vote somebody off the island? All right, so you're the least desirable or, you know, maybe you're a potential winner and we don't like you because you're too good. Either way, you can be rejected or excluded. Uh, the Apprentice, you know, why it's not him that gets voted off with that haircut, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it's the same sort of thing. And we've got lots of shows like that, right? This is, uh, what, The Bachelor? You know, if you don't get the rose, you're, you're shaking your head, do I have the wrong show? No? Okay. Is it? It's, I think it's The Bachelor, some form. Okay, yeah, some form of it, right? If you don't get the rose, then bam, you're out of there. And <clears throat> it's a little more nuanced than that, right? It's not just you're in or you're out. It's social exclusion or people love you, right? There's sh lots of shades of gray. So we live in many, many different social hierarchies. We have lots and lots of different relationships that maybe aren't so involved that we'd call them a social hierarchy, but you know, some people like you and some people really like you, and some people don't like you, and some people really dislike you. Um, so some of the social hierarchies, you may have a position in your family, you may have a position at work, a position among different groups of friends, you know, um, look at the cliques at school, right? You can figure out who, what the cliques are and who the leaders are and kind of the second tier people and all that. And your position, your rank, affects your access to resources. And that's true today, and certainly it would have been true 25, 50,000 years ago, right? You're in a small group. If you're the top dog, so to speak, and I'm actually going to use dogs here in a little while, um, it affects your access to resources. Resources could be the food, could be the health care, could be the grooming from fellow apes um, or fellow humans. It could be, um, what else could it be? Lots of things um, that I mentioned food. Anyway, your, your access to resources, but it's still too, true today. Right, if you look at the rich versus the poor, who's got a safer living environment, who's got a safer car, who's got more mobility, who's got a better education, who's got better health care, on and on and on. Um, and the rank in these hierarchies is determined, if we look at um, other species as well as humans, often in two ways, dominance and attraction. So this is kind of the evolutionary path, because dominance is the older uh, solution to this problem. Dominance hierarchies are maintained by power. They're based on power. So uh, they're maintained by aggression. So if I'm the biggest badass and I can intimidate everybody else, they show their fear and submission to me. <coughs> so it's pretty easy to tell who's the dominant of these two dogs and who's showing submission. And look at what the dog does. It cowers, it makes itself small, it breaks eye contact, it tucks its tail, right? Attraction hierarchies are based on positive qualities. And a positive quality can be virtually anything that's maintained, that's positive in the eyes of others. So these hierarchies are maintained by other people's opinions. You know, it depends on what people think of you to see how you do. That's true of our jobs. Look at, you know, the, the movie stars and the singers with their rise and fall. Um, I think last time I did this presentation, well, not last time, a long time ago, I did this presentation like the night after the Grammys or whatever when Britney Spears completely blew up and people were mocking, at, mocking her, laughing at her, right? You know, opinions of others, she had just dropped in rank. So on the one side, we've got people making judgments of us, and on the other side, you know, we might feel pride when we're on top or shame and deference um, when we're not. So this is a picture I picked up from Harry Potter a few years ago. We've got Hermione turning her back on Ron, and look at what Ron is doing. He's cowering, he's breaking gaze, he won't look her in the eye, he's small, she's dominant, she's, you know, judging him, obviously, and she has her back turned on him. A great cue of exclusion. So, again, going back to the analogy with pain, shame is that, shame is that alarm when there's some threat of full exclusion or even just rank reduction or uh, injury to a, a relationship. An alarm just like pain. We would not want to live without pain. Life would be very dangerous if we didn't have a pain, me didn't have a pain mechanism. You know, you could have a huge cancer and not realize it. You could um, cut yourself without realizing it. You could burn your hand on that stove without realizing it. And in the same way with shame, if you don't have that mechanism, you're handicapped socially. And you may know some people like that, all right? Um, they can be tough to be around. They may be insensitive. They may, um, you know, just be kind of unaware, rude. They may seem entitled. Uh, or they may be psychopaths, okay? 
So sticking with the evolutionary argument, this increases our fitness. I think I gave this away. It helps you maintain your rank in multiple hierarchies. If you don't know the impression you're making on other people, and if you're not sensitive and motivated to make a positive impression, you may step all over people um, and end up tripping on your tongue, saying that you enjoy firing people. Not a good comment from a presidential candidate. That was a little shocking. Um, it also allows us I have here parental manipulation of offspring, but really these emotions, and, and manipulation is a strong word, we don't like that word, but this is science speak, right? What they mean here is just that it allows us to influence one another, often in positive ways. Let me skip down to this one, favors and cooperation. Somebody does you a favor eight times in a row, and then they ask you for a favor, you feel obligated, you feel ashamed or guilty not to cooperate, right? And that's a win-win for everybody. If I do you a favor when it's little cost to me but really bails you out, and vice versa, it's a win-win situation. And that's actually been modeled mathematically uh, with computer, computer models. Um, so going back to parental manipulation, we can socialize our kids um, the way I did with my daughter back there by beating her. Um, <laughs> or, or guilt tripping her. Um, I'm kidding, you know. she. You did leave the dishes in the sink. You didn't leave me any ice cubes. Oh, All right. Sorry. Okay. So <laughs> she she pre-approved this live demonstration of guilt tripping. <laughs> She's really a good kid, especially since she gave up the crack. <laughs> That's another joke. She she approved. Now that was shaming. That wasn't guilt tripping. That was shaming, and she approved that one too. All right. She's never so much as look at looked at a cigarette or or a boy. <laughs> so um, back to my talk. <laughs> you knew you were in trouble. You're very brave, very brave. <laughs> so um, what have we gone through? We've gone through what triggers these, the functions they serve. Lastly, and there's more, but this is last for my talk, in terms of um, this family of emotions, every discrete emotion or every basic emotion from emotion theorist's perspective has a universal facial expression or bodily expression, and this has been demonstrated. Anybody see the TV show um, Tell Me Lies? It wasn't a very popular TV show. Okay. Uh, what's that? Oh, maybe it's Lie to Me. Oh, Lie to Me, Lie to Me. I think Tell Me Lies maybe was his book. Um, that was based on the real work of a psychologist. Uh, just amazing career looking at universal facial expression. So this is the facial expression of these emotions. The severe expression, but shrinking, hiding the eyes. Why do we hide the eyes? Head down, gaze averted. Think back to Cooley. What did Cooley say? The looking glass self. I'm getting away from the looking glass. If your eyes are reflecting an ugly image of me, an image that I don't want to see, I'm going to get away. So we uh, avert our gaze. But it also um, has evolved. Like I said, the dominance hierarchies came first. And that cowering that you see a dog do um, was an evolutionary adaptation. And that has been co-opted by shame. So it's very similar to that cowering dog, what we do. We're communicating submission and willingness to conform. And this serves an appeasement function. An appeasement function means it appeases others, you know, kind of gets us off the hook. As an example, um, think about some little kid comes over to your house with a parent. Um, you've got some stuff laying around. They get into stuff they shouldn't be, and they break something. And the parent says, you go apologize. And they come up and they say, oh, I'm sorry. Do you feel better? Do you feel appeased? OK, now what if that child isn't scolded, if the child breaks it and comes to you with a look of pain on their face, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't, I, it was just so cool. I just wanted to check it out, and it accidentally fell. How do you feel? You feel bad for them, don't you? You actually feel empathy or sympathy for them, this poor kid, because you know they're in emotional pain. And it's sincere. You feel bad for them because they feel pain, they're also communicating that they care about what they did. They care about the relationship and what you think. And they're communicating that they're not likely to do it again. A sincere apology means that they're less likely. Whereas that first kid was like, yeah, whatever. Well, you know, next time he's in my house, he's probably just going to run rampant again. So <clears throat> part of what I just described is we've got this dog sending one message, saying back away from the food bowl. It's controlling this dog's behavior. But on the flip side, this dog is controlling this dog's behavior. It's sending that message, hey, you eat first. 
I'm making myself small. I'm not going to challenge you. I don't want to fight. You go ahead. Don't attack me. And this is adaptive for both animals. They're less likely to injure each other or kill each other, right? You know, pulling the violence trick or the aggression trick is risky business because you could get yourself killed that way. And in terms of pop propagating your genes, that's not a good thing. So a lot of animals will do a lot of bluffing like this. It's not a good strategy to go to pull the aggression uh, card if that other animal is going to fight back. And um, that appeasement function works with those dogs with the dominance hierarchy, and it works very similarly with us with these attraction hierarchies and people's opinions of us. So this um, facial expression we see in other species, other social species, it, you know, theoretically should be linked uh, to just only higher level social species, and indeed we see that. So very important function. All right. So that's kind of a definitional model, evolutionary psych perspective on how we got here, why it's important, the important functions that it performs. I hope I've convinced you you wouldn't want to live without the shame mechanism. But it also has a dark side. Okay? Too much of this um, leads to problems. Depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, uh, violence, drug use, all kinds of compulsive behaviors, anorexia, and even suicide. So, where does it go wrong? Well, if you think about any emotion, any emotion's adaptive. Anger is adaptive. If you never experienced anger, you wouldn't be motivated to change things that are you know, a bad state in your world. If you experience too much anger, that takes its toll on you, and that's a bad thing for you and the people around you. Well, the same thing with shame. Too little, and you're a psychopath. Too much, and you end up with these symptoms. So I mentioned individual differences. I also mentioned um, with Cooley's looking glass self, you're imagining that image in the other person's eyes and you're imagining their judgment. That's a lot of imagination, a lot of assumptions you're making. If you're imagining the wrong thing, that's going to take its toll on you. If you're not realistic, if you don't understand where you stand. So, you know, if you're in a relationship and you've got this bad self image where I'm unworthy of this other person, you know, you're always vigilant as to what they're doing and what they think of you. You may drive them away, or you may be convinced that any relationship's going to end up uh, in failure. Okay, so that's the high end of shame and, and some of the negative sides to it. Um, but it's a little more complicated. So that's part five of my talk here. How am I doing on pace? Okay. Um, <clears throat> the literature is focused on these individual differences and correlations between shame versus positive outcomes, shame and negative outcomes, and um, I've picked up on this model that what comes in between matters. How we cope, how we respond, how we defend against these things makes the difference that sends you off in a positive direction or a negative direction. And when um, I and some other people in this area have looked at how people respond, we commonly see anger. This should be no surprise. Sometimes we're angry at ourselves. Oh, you idiot. You made a fool of yourself. Sometimes we're angry at other people for judging us. How dare you give me that feedback? Um, we often feel stupid. We often feel isolated. That's part of the social exclusion, fear of exclusion. A lot of times we just want to bury our heads in the sand, right? Disappear. We wish the earth could swallow us up. We want to hide. Again, that goes back to Noah's comment. He had to go bury himself after that incident with the uh, TV interview. Um, and it goes back to Cooley's looking glass self. You know, we want to get away from the eyes of others. And then some of us just laugh it off. It doesn't matter. I don't care. Yeah, she dumped me, but she wasn't that great a girlfriend. You know, we laugh it off, right? I, that's hypothetical. I've never been dumped, so I, I wouldn't know. But <laughs> through my research of other people, I've picked up on this, okay? <clears throat> so a, uh, a psychiatrist, Don Nathanson from Philadelphia, developed this model through his own clinical experience and his reading. Uh, but he, he really didn't have any empirical data on this, just lots of clinical experience, and he's a smart guy. But I picked up on the fact I, I like this model and, and his book, and uh, I was a graduate student at the time, and no one had ever really tested this. So I developed a scale, a self-report scale. So we give 12 scenarios that might be shame or embarrassing, shaming or embarrassing or guilt-inducing, and ask people how much would you respond with each of these four styles. And it's been translated into 10 languages now. In fact, I just got emails from China this morning and, and uh, Monday asking uh, for a translation. Supposedly somebody did that, but I lost track of it. So it's being used in a lot of research. So some of the data that I present is mine, and, and some comes from other people. Um, before I talk about each of those, because uh, Nathanson's premise is that these are all variously maladaptive to some degree. 
So before we go there, let's talk about the good side, the, the bullseye. What is the ideal thing to do in these horrifying moments of shame and humiliation um, or guilt? <coughs> and, and it's true for any emotion. When it comes to emotional intelligence, the first thing is to realize, I'm feeling something, right? And there's an emotion going on. And then maybe try to identify it. Gosh, which one is it? You know, maybe I should put a name on it. What, why am I feeling this? And what, if anything, do I need to do about it? So if I'm feeling guilt, maybe I do need to return that favor that that person asked me for. Okay, that's one solution. Other times we may feel shame, um, and the appropriate thing to do is give it up, let it go. So an example that I like is um, you have a perfectionistic student because she has perfectionistic parents with exceedingly high standards and expectations. She works her butt off, tries as hard as she can, she's done everything she can, and she gets a B plus on a test or a paper, it doesn't matter. Shows that to her parents, and her parents were so upset, and she feels that shame. And maybe that's the parents' problem. Maybe they've got unrealistic um, expectations. And what you have there is a funhouse mirror. My image of the looking glass self, I purposely picked a woman looking at herself in a funhouse mirror, a warped mirror. Because sometimes that image that's being reflected back to us isn't very realistic. And we're feeling that emotion because of somebody else's issue. And if that's the case, and you can evaluate that, it's hard to separate yourself. But if you understand that, sometimes the right thing to do is nothing and let yourself off the hook. So anyway, I claim that's the bullseye. I'm going to uh, go through all four of these just real quickly in parallel form. What do we feel? Well, we're kind of ashamed of a shame. Ashamed of shame in our culture. We don't use that word as much. It's much more comfortable to say I was embarrassed or maybe even I felt guilty. But people in interviews and in clinical uh, experience and in counseling will often say, oh, I just really felt bad. Or maybe they felt bad about themselves. But they're acknowledging that things aren't good when they use this withdrawal tactic of coping. They, their thoughts, what are they thinking? I didn't do well, I did screw up, I should feel guilty. Okay, so they are thinking about what's going on here. Their motivation is to reduce that emotional pain, just like getting away from the eyes of others, putting that bag over your head. They withdraw or they hide from the situation. So it's recess, I don't know if they still have recess anymore, if the um, budget cuts have made that obsolete. But imagine you're out there uh, at recess, you know, and you've got a dozen kids picking teams for kickball, and you're the last one picked. Oh man, nobody wanted me. They got stuck with me by default. You know, that might be embarrassing. And it might be easier just to say, nah, I don't want to play, and, and go do something else, walk away, rather than stick around and endure more. So that would be a withdrawal response. Attack self is fairly similar in that people acknowledge, both of these are internalizing. So you're, you're internalizing, you're accepting this message. People say they feel bad, but they make it worse. They magnify it, they often blow it out of proportion. So they get really angry with themselves, they may even experience self-disgust. You know, I'm stupid, I hate myself, things like that. I'll never be successful with this. But if they don't withdraw, if they stick it out, it's usually because they're motivated to be accepted by other people. And to do that, they may show deference. They may be, you know, think about the second tier in the click sucking up to the really cool kids, you know? Gosh, that's so cool, I'm gonna go buy a shirt like that and a hat like that. I'm gonna wear my hat sideways and backwards and you know, whatever it is, they, they try to suck up to those people to fit in. Um, they also may make gargantuan efforts to improve. Perfectionism is really an attack self strategy and we have data on that in athletes and non-athletes. Um, so sometimes if, if I could just be perfect, if I could just be perfect, I'd never experience shame. Right? Isn't that a great goal? Not really. There are other ways to deal with it. Um, so attack other. Now we direct the anger outward. How dare you judge me? Right? I'm focused on your faults or why you're judging me. Uh, I want to bolster my own rank or rec recoup a little bit here. So I may blame other people. Right? It was the ump's fault. It was a bad call. It was the teacher's fault for writing a bad test. They've never said that about me. Um, <coughs> Or another great strategy, right? You get a D on your test, what do you do? Oh, a couple of Fs, all right. I didn't get an A, I may not be on top, but I feel better about myself knowing others did worse. Is that true? Is that true? Uh, I always did that, because I was, I was always getting Ds. It's amazing I'm here. Um, and then finally we have uh, avoidance as a strategy. And here, people feel fine. I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed. Like that girlfriend that dumped, did, never dumped me, right? She wasn't that great anyway. They want to avoid any consciousness of feeling bad. They want to avoid that emotional pain. 
Um, and there are lots of ways to do that. This is the hardest one to measure because there are so many ways to do it. I could disavow that goal, right? I spent uh, seven years working on that bachelor's degree in chemistry and I just couldn't pull it off. But you know, chemistry, I don't really care much about chemistry. I'm just gonna go on to something else. Um, turn to distractions, drugs, sex, rock and roll, any kind of compulsive behavior can work. Um, watching reality TV shows 12 hours a day, uh, playing video games 12 hours a day, works for me. Um, another trick is to focus people's attention on something else. Here's where I'm doing poorly, but hey, check out my new car. I'm the man, I got this cool car, right? All right. I flunked out of school, but I got a cool car. So um, if those sound familiar, and I bet they do, don't worry about it. These are normal. We all do these things. I'm sure there's no one in this room who hasn't done all four of those styles probably today. Maybe in very, very minor non-conscious ways, but they're very common. So it's not something to worry about. Um, I went back to the bullseye because you can look at this. It becomes a problem. It becomes maladaptive when you're stuck in one mode. So if this is the bullseye and you're out there doing attack other, every time there's any sort of ego threat, you're exploding at other people and yelling and getting in fights, you know, think about the fourth grader who does that. They don't end up with many friends. That becomes problematic or they end up in jail. Uh, and that's the other point, is you can look at this as the bullseye and you can be a little bit out this way or you can be way out this way. So when I make a little mistake and I'm like, ah, oh, you idiot, and I let it go, that's really minor attack self. My self-deprecating humor is kind of using attack self sometimes. But if I'm out there thinking about suicide over my mistake, that's extremely maladaptive, just like turning to violence on the other side. So um, they are normal, it's a matter of degree, and these are things that we can look for in ourselves and, and other people. So they failed to warn you there's a quiz. Question one, what movie is this? All right, Napoleon Dynamite. In this scene, he's just found, actually the real quiz is to identify the four different coping styles I'm about to show you. Uh, so he's just found out that the girl he's going to ask to the big dance is going with somebody else. That could be embarrassing or humiliating. So let's see how Napoleon deals. Well, nobody's going to go out with me. Are you asking anybody yet? No, but who would? I don't even have any good skills. What do you mean? You know, like... Lumpjack skills, bow hunting skills, <laughs> computer hacking skills. Girls only want boyfriends who have great skills. So I saw this movie and I went out and I bought nunchucks right away and practiced like 20 hours a day. <laughs> Man, did the dates come in after that. All right. So what is it that he's doing here? He's attacking himself and that's why I picked the clip. There's a, a subtle overtone, undertone, um, of something else. Did anybody else catch it? Okay, well... Oh, oh yeah, well that's part of the, sh the, yeah, the disappointment and that's just Napoleon. Um, but yeah, there's some attack other. Girls only want guys with great skills. There's a little put down and it was actually a, an astute student who picked up on that when I was talking about this in class one day. Um, this is the movie Keeping the Faith with Jen Elfman and Ben Stiller. <clears throat> How many people have seen this movie? Okay, my daughter loves it. He's a rabbi, um, she's Catholic, she's this really high-powered businesswoman, I mean just like mover and shaker. Uh, they've got this clandestine relationship, right? They're having this sexual relationship and it can't get out in his mind because as he puts it, he won't become a made rabbi if uh, the word gets out. So in his mind, this can't really go anywhere. He really likes her, he's in love with her, but this just can't work. And she's just been offered this huge promotion that requires her to move across the country. Perfect out for Ben, right? Here's the thing, okay? I've been thinking about it, and um, I'm excited. And I'm not as excited as I am about you and me. And so I don't think I wanna go, because I wanna be near you, so I thought I'd put in for a transfer and stay here. What do you think? Wow. Um, that's unexpected. Um, it is? Yeah. Are you sure that that is the best thing? Oh, what? For, for you? Oh, I don't know. I, I thought you'd be excited. No, 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 I am. I'm just, I'm just. Check the look. I'm Head sorry. down. I, am I off base here? No. Sorry. You're not. It was just an image. 
impulse. It's totally fine. Okay. So it's totally fine. I thought that we... No, I know. I, I think that tequila shot made me a little giddy. Should we go somewhere and talk about this? No, 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 Let's get out no, of here. No, 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 Let's go no, talk no, about no, it. no, no, no. It's totally great. It's so fine. I'm having a great time. Let's just have fun, okay? Fuck. Ooh. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on there? I love this clip. I have seen this over a hundred times. And it is just such an amazing example. What gave it away? What did she do and say that was avoidant? I'm fine three times. It's great twice. What else? Shots. Little, yeah, you know, a couple shots and some dancing. If you leave out the dancing, I'm good with that. Um, no, actually dancing, those junior high dances, that's why I study shame. Um, that's only half a joke. <laughs> if you've seen me dance, you would understand. So uh, now I've distracted myself. Um, but look at what else she does. It, it goes deeper than that, right? She was going to change her life, pass out this massive, wonderful opportunity because she loves him and values this relationship. Oh, no. It, you know, I think that shot made me a little giddy. Those weren't real feelings, right? And uh, what was the other thing that she says where, where she disavows her feelings? There's another quote in there. You know, but she won't own the importance of that decision, right? It, it was just, oh, it was just an impulse, right? That's the kind of decision you make on an impulse, right? You know, no way. All right, here we have uh, Lindsay Lohan before she went insane. <laughs> and that's not a professional diagnosis, you know. Um, this was back when she was young and innocent, and we know she's neither now. So she's, she's my favorite person to pick on in class. Um, in this movie, this is The Parent Trap. And uh, in this movie, she plays twin sisters. They were separated shortly after birth, before the first year. So they don't even know they have a sister, much less a twin. Their parents accidentally send them to the same summer camp. Um, it's well established by this point in the movie that they're both very competitive. And they end up fencing, having this fencing match. And the one in white beats the one in green. But they've got their masks on, so they still don't know that this is somebody that looks like them. And then they take their masks off after the defeat. And we'll see how she acts. It's kind of like the way she and Paris get along. Don't you see it? You are. The resemblance between us. Resemblance between you and me. Let me see. Turn sideways. Now the other way. Well, your eyes are much closer together than mine. Your ears, well, don't worry, you'll grow into them. Your teeth are a little crooked. What's going on there? Which one, green Lindsay or white Lindsay? Both. Both. And that's a common dynamic, you know, between friends, between partners, between coworkers, between countries, right? There's a little slight that gets escalated, that gets escalated. Um, that dynamic has been um, evaluated when it comes to international conflicts, wars, post-World War Germany. They were left in economic collapse. Uh, had felt humiliated. If you look at the uh, genocides in Rwanda, uh, the uh, friction between the Hutus and the Tutsis, um, in some cases, the leaders actually use this sense of humiliation in this attack other response. You know, we were put down, we need to turn the tide. Um, so that's been evaluated a lot. There's tons of stuff about that um, in the literature and on the internet. Anyway, got to keep moving. Last one for your quiz. This is uh, Shrek. So Princess Fiona, if you don't know, uh, turns into an ogre um, after sunset. And uh, I haven't been an ogre. I I've been called an ogre many times, but <laughs> I've never been one, and I can imagine it might be embarrassing. So um, let's see how she reacts. Hey, Romaine. Okay, so withdrawal. withdrawal. You know, she's just getting away from other people. She doesn't want them to see her bad side. So I think you all passed the quiz. Good job. Um, 
so like I said, there's been a, we've done a lot of research with this, and uh, my research program is focused on two things. The, all, all the definitional stuff that I talked about, and it'll come up again when I talk about humiliation in a minute, and then a lot of the shame coping stuff is really what I've done the most. Uh, so if we look at withdrawal um, correlations with many, many variables, but just the sampling, lower self-esteem, and uh, anxiety, especially social anxiety, right? Because I'm anxious about how I'm going to be evaluated. I'm going to be uncomfortable talking in front of other people. I'm going to be uncomfortable meeting new people. What are they going to think of me? Maybe I'll make my, a jerk of myself. Um, attack self. Because it magnifies that shame message. You know, somebody may have a negative opinion of me, but I blow it out of proportion. Or somebody may give me ambiguous feedback and I take it as negative. Um, attack self leads to the worst outcomes, and we see that uh, pretty reliably. So depression is more intense, self-esteem is the lowest for people who are chronically um, doing attack self. Uh, perfectionism, like I said, fits in here. We've got that really good data. Uh, and there's actually, uh, the perfectionism stuff is interesting because there's adaptive sides and maladaptive sides to perfectionism. If I'm making myself miserable, if I'm laying in bed beating myself up over my mistakes, if I won't allow myself to make mistakes, ruminating, that's the bad side. But, you know, perfectionists can be good to have around. They do a good job, they're organized, they get stuff done. And we actually found correlations with both the positive and the negative side of perfectionism when we looked at the attack self, uh, which is exactly what we predicted. So we were really excited. We found that in three different studies. Um, avoidance, uh, sometimes we see somatization. Soma means body, for those of you who remember French. Um, so bodily symptoms that come from your psychological state. If you're bottling up those emotions, if you're not dealing with them, if you're not facing them, then you may end up with you know, upset stomach, grinding your teeth, headaches. Interpersonal sensitivity is when people are overly reactive. So you say something innocuous, like, that's an interesting shirt. What do you mean by that? You know, they take it as an insult when it's not. So these people are kind of hiding their real feelings, and sometimes they bubble through that way. And then, obviously, with attack, other we're going to see hostility and violence. Uh, we actually did some studies on psychopathy, uh, you know, the psychopath. We, I don't think we had very many real psychopaths because they were mostly college students. But it is uh, <laughs> dimensional. There's a normal curve there. Some people are a little more out in that direction. So that's just a, a small sampling. And I see I'm running late. I could skip humiliation and go right to implications, or I've got about four or five minutes on humiliation. Keep going. Okay, so um, look, we looked at humiliation as a special case for quite a few reasons, but um, one of the big reasons was school shootings. That and the fact that a lot had been written about it, but there was almost no data, almost nothing on humiliation. And if you look at it, like I said, some of my work has been definitional. The OED says it's to make lower, humble in position. Position? What kind of position? Socially, right? So it's our social hierarchies again, it's rank. But you're made low. Someone else is doing this to you, and they're doing it typically on purpose. They have hostile intent. They're trying to hurt you. They're trying to inflict emotional pain, sometimes physical pain as well, and lower your status intentionally. If I'm trying to lower your social status, you know, you really are being attacked. The self is under siege at this moment, and if I'm going to be effective, I should do it in front of an audience. I should wait till people are around before I bully you, before I put you down. So for uh, several of these reasons, it ends up in a very high intensity emotion. This is some data from uh, six different studies in, um, combined. We asked people, how badly do you feel about yourself? We don't want to give away any of these emotion words, but just this idea that there's a general commonality among all these emotions. And embarrassment was kind of in the middle there. Shame was quite a bit higher, and humiliation was the highest. It is a, a, an intense experience. What kind of coping does it motivate? What do you think? Uh huh. In the sense of, oh, you're trying to humiliate me while. Yeah, that was embarrassing. <laughs> uh huh. Right, I may try to turn the tables, revenge, retaliation. Um, what else? It could be any of those. It could be any, and people do everything, you know, in these bad moments, and we may cycle through them very quickly. And sometimes we flip flop, you know, I attack self until I'm getting tired of being mad at myself, and then I'm angry at the other person for making me feel that way. Um, or I attack somebody off the cuff, I get angry and yell at someone, and then later on I feel guilty. Oh, they didn't deserve it. I shouldn't have done that. Um, but with humiliation, with the intensity, um, sometimes we see some really bad stuff, you know, self-disgust all the way up to suicide. And unfortunately, this has been in the news um, more and more, cyberbullying, right? There's a whole new domain now to mess with people. 
and it's resulted in a number of suicides, um, especially with teenagers. Ryan Halligan back in 2003, you know, so we have ages here at 13, 13, and 15. These kids were bullied to the point that they finally could not take it and committed suicide. Um, attack other is why we looked at this initially, um, <clears throat> that hostility and violence, this notion of humiliated fury, humiliation fury, that humiliation anger link that I mentioned before with France. So it motivates thoughts of revenge or retaliation. Sometimes actions, okay, I don't want to know how many people have taken action, but how many of you have thought that a little retaliation would be a sweet thing, right? You toss and turn over what a crappy day, what that person did to you, and you think how you could have turned the tables. If only I'd been quick enough to come have that pithy comeback. Uh, sometimes people are overly reactive. We have road rage, damaged property, um, people attacking each other on the internet. And like I said, we originally looked at this because um, of the school shootings. Uh, I've got an, a book chapter published on this and every school shooting that we looked at up until that time, that was a couple years ago, and there had been 12 involved ridicule, teasing, harassing, bullying of the sh uh, school shooters. And since then I've still read about all of them and that seems to be there. Other things being uh, dumped uh, by a par romantic partner, being put down, a, a teacher or an administrator put them down in front of other people, and sometimes a combination of multiple of these. And my clicker's not doing well. So that fits the profile of what humiliation is all about, and they turn to revenge and retaliation. So attack other, that attack other coping response showed up in these cases as <coughs> murdering other people, and suicide is an attack self response. <clears throat> At Virginia Tech, this is a quote, um, do you know what it feels like to be spit on your face and have trash shoved down your throat? Do you know what it feels like to be humiliated for your amusement? He used that word. 32 murdered, 25 wounded, one suicide. So we see both the attack other and attack self. At Columbine, the jocks ridiculed me, chose not to accept me, treated me like I'm not worth their time. Um, they were cornered, pushed, ridiculed, bashed against lockers. 13 murdered, 24 wounded, two suicides. So, you know, there's some very serious consequences of these emotions. Um, Luke Woodham did not commit suicide, and afterwards he, he was um, quoted as saying, I killed because people like me are mistreated every day. I was ridiculed, always beaten, always hated. His motive was revenge on his ex-girlfriend. She was one of the three people uh, who he killed when he went to school that day, and he wounded seven others. So, you know, um, not to make light of it, you know, we talk about collateral damage. And in our research, we've looked at this. I mean, some people get so angry, they're willing to lash out at people who aren't really involved or just marginally involved, just somebody who was there to witness what happened. So, um, like I said, we've done a number of studies on, on humiliation. And just to kind of back what I'm saying about this dynamic, that hostile intent, that perception that somebody's doing this intentionally to hurt me is the best predictor of when people use that word humiliation like in my first vignette. Um, humiliation in turn is the best predictor of violent ideation, thinking about revenge. Uh, these are correlations. Correlations run from zero, meaning there's no relationship, to one, a perfect relationship. And it's hard to find correlations like that in social science research. Uh, 0.88 is pretty darn high. So our thesis here is that humiliation is the mediator all right, it's kind of like playing pool. You hit one ball into another into another. There's that event of humiliation that leads to the emotion that fuels the behavior, the retaliation. So that's what we were looking at uh, in our research. It is such a common dynamic that it shows up in literature. You know, Stephen King, this was a book for some of you who don't know, before it was a movie. Um, Carrie captures that well, right? This is out of the trailer, it was on the internet. Her classmates taunt her. They embarrass, there's that embarrassed word, in front of the whole school, there's your audience, and it's done to her on purpose, and everyone laughs at her. All the components of humiliation, and what does she turn around and do? She kills, them with her psychic powers. She kills everybody with her psychic powers, burns the school <laughs> down while she locks everybody in there, you know? Um, and then on the lighter side, Revenge of the Nerds, it's the same thing, right? They're the nerds. The odd get even, they admit that they're odd. They've been laughed at, picked on, put down, put down is to humiliate, but they turn the table. Just like we lay there and fantasize, oh, I wish I could have turned the tables. You know, this is a fantasy, right, for a lot of kids. And this is especially um, a common theme in, you know, kind of adolescent, young adult um, media. 
And what a good depiction of turning the tables. We stand there with our backs on the, our feet on the backs of the jocks with the hot girls. <laughs> <coughs> that was never part of my fantasies of turning the tables. Okay, <coughs> so let me wrap up with some uh, implications here. Um, this is the model I presented that we've got coping in the middle here. We've got negative outcomes and bad out or positive outcomes, and it's pretty simple. We don't want to end up here. We want to promote the positive side of shame. Shame's not shame and related emotions. You know, um, mild instances of shame are very, very functional and very important for us. But we might want to minimize unnecessary shame, public shame, or overly intense shame. So there's one point of intervention. The other point of intervention is to look at coping and what's being done there. Okay, push people toward the bullseye. So how do we do that? I've just got one slide on each. Reduce competition. All right. Here at school, oops, here at school or across the country, we're not allowed to post grades. We're not allowed to make people's grades public. I think that's a great policy. Uh, more frequently, kids are getting together, young kids are getting together and playing games without keeping score. We're playing for 45 minutes for fun and for exercise, not to see who beats who. I think those are good policies. Um, we, and I mean teachers, parents, coaches, doctors, all kinds of different people, can encourage mastery goals and intrinsic motivation. The message that success equals progress. You don't have to judge yourself against other people. Are you doing better today than you did last week? Then today's a good day. That's success. Um, this one is a big one for me. Mistakes are natural. You know, as teachers and parents, we can get up at the board or, you know, sit down and do basic algebra flawlessly really quickly and it looks easy. Do it without a mistake. And our students see that and they're like, wow, why do I struggle? Well, we used to struggle. I mean, I know I did. And I think we do our kids and our students a disservice when we say, oh yeah, you know, here's four pages of differential equations homework. It's easy. Don't worry about it. What kind of message is that? You ought to be telling them this is differential equations. This is pretty hard. You're going to have to buckle down. You're going to have to put some time into this. Expect to work hard, to make an occasional mistake, and see if you learn from those mistakes. If you give that message, that's more realistic. Then they're not blindsided and they don't feel stupid when that happens. I've uh, done a lot of rock climbing and coached a lot of people in rock climbing. And, you know, to say, okay, you know, it's time for a little challenge. You're probably going to fall off this climb, but it's safe and it's a good challenge and that's how you get better. Sending that message works really well. I've worked with kids who were so traumatized by school you know, I'm like, I'm Mr. Math Science Guy, and this was a Big Brothers program. I'm going to help this kid. I'm going to change this kid's life. I'm going to do homework with him. Oh my God, that kid didn't want to do homework with me? But then I'd take him climbing, and he'd see me and my friends failing over and over again, and being persistent and trying. Fall, try, fall, try, fall, success. And he was fine with falling. That, that failure, he wasn't embarrassed about. So it's all about context. Uh, respect for individual differences. A lot of times people feel shame or humiliation over their individual differences, so it's really important that we respect those. Um, acceptance should not hinge on performance. It's like the whole thing, you know, you're not a bad kid, you just did a bad thing. Um, that sounds trite, but I think there's some value to that. And just in general, um, I think parents who give the message, I love you when you do well, when you perform for me, are setting kids up for failure and things like anorexia. Uh, bullying I've already talked about. You know, some people say, well, it's a natural part of adolescence. Uh, even if it's natural, it's not right. We need to minimize that. And there are a lot of programs right now uh, in the schools to minimize that. All right, so <clears throat> I think there's just one more wrap-up slide but after this one. So we can watch for maladaptive coping. I talked about those, and it should be a little bit easier now to identify those in yourself and in other people. And it is. Look around you. You know, go to the grocery store and some kid's misbehaving, having a tantrum. What does the mom do? Freaks out at him. Why? Because he's embarrassing her. I was in the library here last semester, and one of our students had like a three-year-old. Somebody was babysitting, the three-year-old brought her in, and the three-year-old was whining. And she said, don't you embarrass me. What did I tell you about doing this at work? You know? Exactly. It's exactly that attack other response. Um, and you can help kids, kids who are stuck in this mode, you know, explain to them, try to get them to realize this isn't working for you. You know, every time there's a little ego slight or you don't feel like you fit in, attacking other kids uh, isn't going to win their love. Anger itself. When you see somebody getting angry with themselves, ask yourself why. Uh, dropping goals. Sometimes it's appropriate to drop goals, but a lot of times we drop goals because we've just had too much embarrassment, too much humiliation uh, around those things. That's why I gave up dancing. I could have had a great career. Um, <clears throat> model adaptive coping. 
You know, what's that bullseye look like? Well, handle your own mistakes gracefully and don't hide them, acknowledge them. Um, Acknowledge the limits of your own knowledge as a teacher. You know, it's okay to say, well, I don't know. You know, why don't you go find out and get back to us next week, or I'll find out and report back to you. But, I, you know, I think there are lots of ways we can do this gracefully. Um, you know, if you've made a mistake, well, I'll just try it again. So some take-home messages. Hopefully these are all glaringly obvious by now. Shame emotions are adaptive. They're, I believe they're an evolutionary adaptation. They're very important. We have them. Um, they're not necessarily about being a bad person. Yeah, if you're a bad person deep down inside, then you're going to feel shame and embarrassment. But sometimes it's mild. Sometimes it's just a miscommunication. Sometimes it's a funhouse mirror that we're looking in. Sometimes it's circumstances. You know, you've got two groups of friends who invite you over for a Thanksgiving dinner. You've got to say no to one of them. You know, gosh, that's a bind that you're put in. Um, minimize shame, encourage adaptive coping. And those were the last two slides. And like I said, sometimes if it's a funhouse mirror you're looking at, it's okay to let yourself off the hook. If you've screwed up, you've apologized, you've done everything you can to, you know, even the tables, don't dwell on it, don't ruminate, uh, learn from it and move on. So <clears throat> that's pretty much it. I'm doing a summer workshop that's worth one upper division credit, and it's these dates, 723, 724. Uh, it's six hours a day, and we have a lot more discussion, a lot more examples, more fun with this. So if anybody's interested, um, anybody can sign up for that. You don't have to be a junior or a senior or even a college student here. The end.